two Lutheran churches in Phoenix. She was the pastor there. Yeah. Um, I was the interim pastor because we had a very close relationship. And then um, she was called to be the pastor and immediately got pregnant. So when the baby was born, I was the interim pastor. And then she got pregnant again. And when that baby was born, I was interim. So she was there, I think, three years. And I think I was the interim pastor for something like. Well, she said she went to you for everything. Nine months. Mm -hmm. Whenever she needed advice, she'd yes, she go did. to you. And when she found out I was coming here, she said she'd have to send me monthly mail. She was my, she was a wonderful person. Her, her predecessor and I were like this. We could complete each other's sentences. And Bruce Davidson. Her husband's a pastor, too. Her right? husband's a pastor, yeah. Tom something. Not uh, Tom Gilbranson. Thank you very much for having YouTube, because as you know, in the month I can't come in my face, and I was able to watch some of YouTube. Good. Well, I didn't miss it. Whatever, we're gonna, whatever we might have missed, um, that whatever technical problems we have had are, are supposedly solved. As soon as Karen, Sharon comes in, we'll turn it on. But in the meantime, I owed you something, and that's what I passed out. And that is, um, this is the, this is not the chart I wanted to give you. Um, I have a chart somewhere in the files, and I kept getting interrupted all day before I could print it, of the of the Old Testament manuscripts that look like the New Testament stuff I gave you all last week, mm -hmm. and I can't find it. Uh, I don't know. I just don't know where it is. So. I'm go back and turn this on myself. I also got some instructions. Oh, look, it's on. So the instructions I got from Sam Hutchinson is that I'm supposed to say welcome. <laughs> and I'm supposed to say that this is the third of these sessions. Um, and, and today... I'd like to get at some of the things we didn't get at last week that I planned to get on at last week. Um, but I want to start with this little um, paper I handed out because um, um, last week we talked about manuscripts and, and Old Testament, you know, the oldest documents. But I want to call your attention to the dates at the top of this page because there's several dates here that are really, really important. Um, and I'm going to add a few more, and we will do more of this. But when you, when you read the Bible, one thing is helpful is to know a little bit about when things radically change in the Bible. So just, just a couple of dates that are not on there and some that are on that page. The first date, and this is an approximation, is 1,000 one B.C. give or take 50 years <laughs> in either direction. That date is important because on th somewhere around then, uh, several things happened in the Bible that affect us to this day, and in fact, affect the whole world to this day. Um, this is the date when David became king of Israel and Judah. Just keep that in your head for now. I'll, I'll be much more specific. But Israel is the northern kingdom of, it's, it's everything outside of the kind of environs of Jerusalem. It's, it was Israel. And that's where the ten tribes are. And then Judah and Benjamin are, are two tribes that are together in and around the area of Jerusalem and Beth, Bethlehem. So David became the king of both kingdoms. And, and so that a united, a united Israel in 1000 BCE with one capital city, Jerusalem. So in 2000, the city of Jerusalem, the current city of Jerusalem, celebrated their 3,000th anniversary. Big deal. One of the parts of the big deal was they had Dale Chihuly sculptures <laughs> all over the city. That's why we didn't get it for our head. That's why we didn't get it, right? <laughs> That's why I got it for the but, but so, so Jerusalem became the capital of a united um, kingdom of Israel and Judah. 
You'll see why this is important in a minute. Um, and then David's son became the next king. And David's son's name is, anybody know? Solomon, Shlomo, in, which means peace. Um, although he had a, that was his throne name, he had another name that nobody knows, even though it's in the Bible. So I'm going to tell it to you. Jedediah. His name was Jedediah. So you know the, the Clampets in Beverly Hillbillies? Yes. Jed Clampet, Jedediah. His name, that's the, the baby's name, and the baby grew up to be Shlomo. Or Solomon. And he took this one step further. He took a, the United Kingdom and he gave it a center, not just a city center, but a religious center called the Temple. So by 900, and these are all round figures, there's some much more specific ones. By 900, in the Hebrew scriptures, there is one kingdom, there is one capital city, and there is one temple, which lasted exactly one more king. Rehoboam is the next king, um, and Rehoboam, uh, each king, David, Solomon, Rehoboam, became more and more centralized government became more central. By the time you get to the third king, there is there are things like taxes, there is the draft, there is what's called um, curve, which means that you get you can be uh, you can be dragooned into serving uh, in, in to build highways or to build um, to carry packages to whatever you could be you can be brought into government service. There was a central authority, a central priesthood, all this. And that didn't go well with the folks in those, of those other ten tribes who lived outside of Jerusalem and Judah and Benjamin. And so the kingdom split in about 840. Might have been a little before, might have been a little after. Um, and it became the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah with two different kings. In Judah, the kings were always of one family, the family of David. And in Israel, the way you became a king was usually by a military coup. Uh, you'd have, like the first king is Jeroboam the first. His son became the next king. His son was deposed and some other general became, and it works its way down all the way until two other dates I'll give you. So a good portion of the Hebrew scriptures <coughs> and all the books of the prophets, all of them, come from the period after the kingdom has divided. And that's important because in several cases, you have someone going from Jerusalem up to um, the north, up to Israel, to, to be a prophet. For instance, the prophet Amos says, I'm from Tekoa. Tekoa is down by Jerusalem. And he gets sent up to Samaria, which is the capital of the northern kingdom. Um, and he says, you know, they say, well, you're a prophet. And you want us all to go down and you know, worship down there in, in, in Jerusalem, and you want us to pick David as the, David's children as the king. Um, and, and Amos says, hey, I'm not a prophet. I'm not a prophet, son. I'm, uh, I'm a uh, grower of sycamore trees. Um, and, and I got sent here because God sent me here. So there's a lot of stuff that happens in the northern kingdom. And some of the stories you know of pretty well. You know the Jezebel? That story, right? Um, the opera is written about Jezebel. Jezebel's from the northern kingdom, not from Jerusalem. Um, the, I, Elijah and Elisha, a lot of those stories are about a prophet going north. So it's, it's important God, to know this division. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Would have God, um, would have God sick, make it be his people, both or he, and split? Who did he stay with? Who is it? Come back in, uh, 
three or four weeks here, <laughs> and we'll talk about that. Because the answer is they all worship the same God, but they worship that God differently. Um, and they worship them in different places. And, and we know this even from the New Testament, because there you have this whole group of people in the New Testament in Jesus' time. Um, one of them becomes a hero, at least in a story, um, who are not Jewish. Uh, and the Jewish people in Jesus' time really despise them, and they still do. Um, they're called Samaritans. They worship the same God. They have um, only five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Um, they're, they, they worship at Mount Gerizim. It says so in, in, um, in, uh, in John. And um, um, they're looked down on, and that's why the Good Samaritan is such a story about an outsider who's really an insider, but not quite. So this division there. becomes important. And they're still there. Still there. There's less than a thousand. Right. It's a really Some small, uh, very, you might say it's a very <coughs> conservative <coughs> Hebrew not Jewish, Hebrew sect. They're not Jews. Everybody else is. They're Samaritans. And they still sacrifice animals. Still yes. sacrifice animals. So anyway, that division comes in 840. And then two more dates, and we'll finally get to one of them on the page. The first is 722 BCE. And in 722, uh, the superpower of the day, they changed superpowers sort of like in the 20th century, you know. Um, for a while it's the uh, Egyptians, and then it's the Babylonians, and then it's, uh, I'm mean, sorry, the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, they changed, they changed the empires. Um, in 722 the superpower were the Assyrians who have the worst reputation of any uh, military power until Adolf Hitler. Um, and the Assyrians come down from <coughs> the area around uh, Iraq, modern day Iraq, and they wipe out the 10 tribes in the north. And they surround Jerusalem, and he, the king there has to pay tribute to them, but there's a wonderful story about why they don't take over Judah. Um, but the Assyrians, um, you've heard of the lost ten tribes? That's when it happens. We don't know what happens to these ten tribes of people from Israel, not from Judah, but from Israel. They're gone. And then the next big event is now on that page, and that starts in 597, but the real um, important date is 586. B, C, E. And by now the Assyrians have been wiped out. Look at the difference between 722 and that's only 40 years. Um, and the new superpower is the Babylonians. The Babylonians attack Judah and carry the people of Judah, the king, everybody else into exile. And it's from this period on, 586 on, that we start to get written scriptures. What do you mean by exile? During the exile. They were in exile in two places. 90% of them went into exile. And exile means you don't take the homeless on the street, you take the people in this room, uh, and the king, and etc. They went to Babylon. Some went to Egypt. So they may have been slaves at this point? No, they weren't slaves. They were just simply not, they were, they were in a different country. Um, they could, if they were shopkeepers, they were still shopkeepers. They were just shopkeepers in Babylon. And kept so they just took them and, and, and plot them, <coughs> and did you them, put them right into their country, right. and made them a name. Right. Um, which is why we have written books, scriptures, because you've got to have a way to tell your story when you don't have any land, or property, or nation, or even language. Two things happen in this period. Um, they're in exile. Uh, there's no temple, there's no priests, uh, it's important to know. But the two things that happen are, is it this, in this period that they start down to write down the scriptures, and in this period, they change languages. Hebrew dies as a spoken language. And Aramaic, which is the language Jesus spoke, and a language still spoken today 
in the Syrian Orthodox Church. It's the only place on earth that speaks Aramaic as their, as their language of worship. Um, and they started speaking that language then. So that by the time they came back out of exile in the 400s, nobody spoke Hebrew anymore. So these days are kind of important because big changes happen. A, ki a united kingdom, a, a divided kingdom, a, a kingdom that goes away, um, and a kingdom that goes into exile. And it's from this group of people who were exiles that the hope is that we can go back to Jerusalem and have our own king again. And the king is called the Messiah, the anointed one who must come from the house of David. So when Jesus is born, in, when you hear the story in Luke, the good part of the good news is that this one is of the house and lineage of David, which fulfills the messianic stuff. So, so this event becomes a pivotal event uh, in the in the Old Testament in the Hebrew Scriptures, and every one of them is important. And I know that most of you have never heard of either of any of these three dates, but that's now you have. So, so, so the Jewish people now. When they were in exile, they rewrote all their old stuff from Adam Babylon, and it's a new. So they yeah, rewrote Hebrews right. now because it's Hebrew has their own language. So how if that was extinct? Okay, the language out of that that changed. No. Do you hear it now? No. Hebrew is a modern language. The Hebrew spoken Israel is a modern language, based a little bit on the old, on what we call Old Testament Hebrew, but not really. I mean, it's 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 as, it's as different. Um, as modern English is from Beowulf. Yeah, or Sanskrit. Hindi yeah, from or, Sanskrit. Or Hindi from Sanskrit. How did they get a new language between Babylon? They worked really hard. You know, they had it. Again, part of the job is to create a community, a nation. How you create a nation? You've got a people coming from all over the so world. Built a new, new so language. The Psalms are letters, right? Mem, Rush, and all those guys. That's right. the Hebrew letters, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. So I thought it was important you have these dates. Um, just so you have any, because big things happen and big changes happen, and they all are affect the Bible. Um, and the other date I'm going to give you, which is a New Testament date, is this date, and that's 70 of the Common Era. Which again, we know from history, but you have a hard time finding it. In the, old, in the New Testament, that's when Jerusalem has been destroyed by another empire, the Romans. Um, and among the other things that happen out of that is that there are no more witnesses left uh, between 70 and 80. They, they, we start losing witnesses to the resurrection, to, to Jesus ministering in resurrection. And when you, don't, when you lose witnesses, you've got to have something else. And that something else are written Gospels. I thought between um, uh, the Romans and the preceding government, there were the Persian government and the Greek, Greek government. We'll get into this in detail, but from here, to, I mean, they get to go back um, about 500 is, Babylon is wiped out by the Persians. And the Persians let them all go back. And they build, uh, under Cyrus the Persian, who is referred to also as a messiah in the, in the Bible, Cyrus lets them go back and rebuild everything. And that works out really well. And then the Persians, for about 200 years, are the major empire. Um, and, and, and Israel, uh, Judah rather, becomes more and more independent. They have priests who are kind of the government leaders. Um, and then in 3, 330 BCE, Alexander the Great comes along, you all know this from history, and wipes out the Persians. And now it's a Greek place. You know, <clears throat> a lot of problems with that, we'll get into them. And in, um, then there's a revolt against the Greeks, um, led by a group of people called the Maccabees. They set up another kingdom, this is about 200 BCE. And then the Maccabees are again priests, and they get into, into a family argument about who's running the country. And so one, 
members, one group of the family in 174 BCE, says, I know what we'll do. In order for me to be in charge of this country, I need help. And there's this wonderful little country over here um, that has an army in the next town, next country, and it's called the Roman army. And so he invites the Romans in, Romans take over, and the Romans don't leave until 140. But by then they have wiped out Jerusalem and everything else. And you know that story because that's the time when we have the New Testament. When you invite the Romans in, they don't leave? The, the, those Romans don't leave. <laughs> no, they don't leave until they level the place. So, so you know, you have this series of empires that just take over this, this land. And um, if you think about all the problems going on in the Middle East today, you can almost trace all of it back to this period, including, you know, the one nation that's mentioned over and over again. Sometimes they like them, sometimes they don't like them, sometimes they're allies, sometimes they're enemies, is the Syrians. And often mentioned when it mentioned Syria is, they mentioned the capital of Syria, which still is Damascus. And so Damascus continues to be the oldest continually inhabited city in the world. And always was either a friend or a foe of the, of the people living down in Jerusalem in that area. So I just wanted to lay that out because when we start talking about things in the Bible, the dates are kind of helpful to know what happened. Not to know everything that happened, just that there's a, um, there's a big switch that happens when each one of these things happen. Um, and, and it's all reflected in the Bible. Um, and becomes very important. Every one of these becomes very important to the story of Jesus, which means it becomes very important to our story. And the other thing worth saying is that from 722 on, all of the stuff I'm saying to you is not only in the Bible. It's in the, re it's in the archaeological record. So you can read in the annals of Assurbanipal, who's the emperor of, of, of Assyria. You can read the story on a stone pillar of how they have destroyed Israel and they've locked the king of Judah, quote, um, like a bird in the cage in Jerusalem from somebody else. You can read in the, in the 600s and the 500s, you can read about um, Ne and Nebuchadnezzar and Nabopolassar and all those characters who and what they do to, to Judah. Um, and you can read, of course, about the Romans. Um, but then, but we'll get to that. So I, I want you to see that because that sort of ties some loose ends in from, from last week. And then, uh, if you don't have any questions, I want to go on to kind of forms of literature that's in the Bible. And then next week, hopefully, we're going to look at um, kind of a teaser about the Gospels, and in the following week, a teaser about what will come on October 16th, which is um, the, 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 the Pentateuch, the, the Torah. So, anybody have any questions about all the stuff we've done so far? Okay. Now I need notes. Oh, I know what I wanted to do. Remember I said that if you, if you look at a Greek or a Hebrew Bible, um, you, at the bottom of the page, there are critical, what are called critical apparatus. And they have little uh, things in them which say, um, they, they'll, they'll, they'll look at a chapter, uh, I mean a verse, the stuff at the bottom of these pages. I don't expect you to read this, it's in Greek. Um, and the notes are in Latin and Greek and German. Um, but they have little letters, in ca capital letters that are in bold print. Some of them are, are uh, italic, some of them are not. Every one of them, is a um, is a manuscript so that the word you see that they're noting is in those manuscripts. So just, I'll just pass it around. You can, any page you turn to, you'll find it. And in Hebrew, this is the Hebrew Bible, which starts in the back. So I don't expect you to read this either, except for Sharon, who does read it. Um, and at the bottom of these pages, again, any page you turn to, you'll get it. Um, are, are the same, is the same thing. These are the notes on, that tell you that where the manuscripts are that support this text. Okay. 
okay? So it, you, it, you won't make sense. But the point of it is to show you that every page, literally every page, some have longer ones than others, there's a very short one, have a bunch of places where they, when there's a question about what the text is, they pick the oldest one. Okay, so I'll pass it that way. You can find records. We can look to the world and find right. Yes, and if you look at this list, at the bottom where it says manuscripts, it starts to tell you about those manuscripts. So I'm not going to read all this because why print it if you're going to read it? Um, but it tells you where things are at the bottom of the last page. I'm going to set the turn it turn it to the back. It talks about two sets of things: the Chester Beatty papyri, which are um, well, it's a papyrus, so it's paper sort of. Um, uh, nine Old Testament books. Uh, in Greek from 100, old, from 100 to 400 AD. And then the two, my two favorites, and there's the third, um, Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus. I've seen Vaticanus actually physically uh, when I was in Rome this year ago. But look how they date. So the oldest copies, Greek copies of the Bible, translations, the oldest one date to 350 A.D. or C.D. There's one more, and you can actually see it, and you don't have to leave the country. It's in, um, it's called Codex Washingtonus. <laughs> Guess where it is? The Library of Congress. It's the third, it's, it, there's the one in Leningrad, the one, Mount, the one on Mount Sinai and St. Catherine's Monastery, which I really would like to see, but probably never will. The one in the Vatican, and then there's the uh, one in Washington. Whole, whole Bibles, Old and New Testament, Hebrew and Christian scriptures, whole books, everything's there, um, and they're the oldest ones we have. And then we have, you know, other stuff. But I wanted you to see that. Now, somewhere is a Bible and some notes. <clears throat> okay. Think about the Bible and think about what forms of writing you know are in the Bible. You, you say some and I'll write them down. I'm not talking about Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. I'm talking about forms of writing. Prophecy. Okay, prophecy is a form of writing. We'll put that down. Letters. Good. Songs. Um, what did you say? Songs. Songs. Another word for songs are, are um, poets, poems. Um, letters. What else you got? Is separate I would call that uh, songs. History. History. Which we're going to put in quotes. <laughs> what else you got? Parables. Par uh, parables, okay, that's a good one. Yeah. Prayers. Prayers, good. A lot of P's here, folks. Yeah. Stories. Stories, yeah. excellent. And I'm going to give it another name. Um, and I'm, I'm going to mean it as positive. Myths and legends. Mm -hmm. Uh, when you go to one to get your family off, like if you told your kid you're never going to run away without getting your high school diploma, and they can have to get your high school diploma. Okay, what do you prophecy. call that? Prophecy. I know it's Not prophecy. Genealogy? Pick a book that does that. You know a book that does that in the Bible? I know a book that does that in the Bible. <laughs> Not my favorite Wisdom. book. Wisdom. Wisdom is exactly the word I would use to describe the whole thing. But the book I'm asking you for is called the Proverbs. Proverbs. Oh, yeah. oh, wisdom is a big. Proverbs. Okay. Wisdom is big. What else you got? Laws. Laws. Well, we got lots of them. Specific kind of forms of writing. I'll give you one that you all know. And it's a specific form. It's called a gospel, which is different. 
Do you have any others? Why is the gospel not a song? Because not. <laughs> well, it's not. It's closer to a history. But it's not. Think anything else? Oh, I got one more. There's one in the Bible. It's called a sermon. Anybody know what's what what that is? One sermon. On the mount. Hmm? On the mount. No, no. It's a, actually it's a book, separate individual book in the Bible. Hebrews, letter to the Hebrews, to quote letter to the Hebrews. And um, another form that we'll have to talk about is called um, apocalyptic literature. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Is that a prophecy? No. And if you put it there, you get in trouble. I know you'd say that, but I'll hear it. Apocalyptic literature, which is about the end times. Two books like that, one is the book of Revelation in the New Testament, and in the Hebrew scriptures, it's the book of Daniel. And there's a little bit of Malachi, but mostly it's a separate form, it's a separate kind of literature. Uh, it's very, very um, specific in how it comes out. So I think we did it. These are the kind of all the forms, and everyone, you know, you, you listen and you read these things differently. And if you read uh, Jared's sermons, um, it's different than reading um, News and Notes, uh, which is a letter. If you read the Constitution of St. Peter's Church, you know it's different than reading um, the Gospel according to St. John. Um, if you read, uh, um, if you listen to what Voices does, um, you know that's going to be different um, than the Constitution. They're all different. You listen to them, you hear them differently, um, you respond to them differently. Um, uh, advice given is different from law, right? If, you know, if you ask for advice, it's sort of, okay, I could take it or not take it. Law, we get a little more serious. So there's all those different forms and the way you, the way they are presented to you um, is is the way should govern the way you hear them and you will hear them differently and it's important that you hear them differently so you get the message so I thought we'd look at some of these things some of these forms just to see what happens and God in God's wisdom decided that not this past Sunday but the Sunday before we should hear an entire letter from the New Testament Anybody remember what that letter was? Philemon. Philemon. So if you open your Bible, and, and just think about letters for a minute. Any letter will do that, you know. Why do people write letters? I mean, to what people? Hmm? To communicate something. Right. Um, cell phones. Yes. Maybe a lost art. So it's cool that we can look at Philemon is toward the back. It's um it's after Titus and before Hebrews. Um, you don't need to we'll get much more specific about this, but if you if you um this is a considered an authentic letter of Paul. They're not all considered to, to be written by Paul, but this one is considered to be one of them that is. Um, so I thought we'd take a few minutes, because it's so short, and read it, and then see if you can guess from the letter itself why Paul wrote this letter. Why did he write the letter? And that will get us to what I think is an important thing to know about the Bible. So. Why doesn't someone just start reading the beginning of the letter? Anybody just start. Paul. Paul. Go ahead. Good. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth. Oh, I think you're in the wrong book. Yeah. Mm. But you must be in Philippians. <laughs> you're in Philippians. Philemon. No, you're in Titus. Titus oh. Philemon. 
it's five minutes after. Oh. Okay. If you don't stop, there it is, right there. There you go. Sorry, sorry. It's all right. Reset. Reset. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, to Apia, our sister, to our kid, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. What do you call that? Meetings. Meetings. It's a greeting. It's the address yeah. and the greeting, right? Yeah. To these people, hi. Yeah. Except when Paul says hi, he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so that's we know, it's something we know about letters. We know who they're written to. And we know um, um, that they have to be delivered to them. And we know that people usually greet other people when you write a letter. So keep reading. When I remember you in my prayers, I always thank my God because I hear of your love for all the saints and your faith toward the Lord Jesus. I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective when you perceive all the good that we may do for Christ. I have indeed received much joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, my brother. For this reason, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do your duty, Yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love. And I, Paul, do this as an old man, and now also as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I am appealing to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I had become during my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, that is, my own heart, back to you. I wanted to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. Perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while so that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. I say nothing about your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, let me have this benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ, confidence of your obedience. I am writing to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. One thing more, <coughs> prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping through your prayers to be restored to you. And then the final reading, benediction. Epiphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, <coughs> Dennis, Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Okay, so <coughs> can you tell who writes the letter? Mm -hmm. He tells you, right? Yeah. I'm yeah. writing a letter. My name is Paul. I'm writing a letter. Okay. And I'm not writing it alone, I've got company. Timothy's with me. And you can tell um, who he's writing the letter to. He's writing to someone called Philemon. <coughs> now the question is, why did he write the letter? What's the purpose of the letter? Yeah. Philemon means useful, right? No, omnisimus, but we'll get to him in a minute. What, why does Paul write the letter? What's, what's the issue here? The issue is uh, the runaway slave. Run away. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so it looks like the deliverer of the letter from the book itself, the person who is actually physically carrying the letter from wherever Paul is to wherever Philemon is, is Onesimus. Right. Whose slave is he? Philemon's. Philemon's slave. What happened? Why? Why is? What is the issue here? What's the problem? He was in jail with him for imprisonment with Paul. Right. He was in prison with Paul. And what's his relationship to, what's Philemon's, I mean, uh, Onesimus' relationship to Philemon? Well, 
It's the master. So what does that mean? That if he's with Paul, what does that mean? He's no, it doesn't. No, that very clearly that's not true. Okay. But what's happened here? What is finally what is Onesimus done? Run away. He's run away. So now it's my property. Forget our modern sensibilities. This is my property. And he's run away to be with Paul in prison. Probably be, was with him before he got arrested. Um, what does Paul want Philemon to do? Free. Free. So he sends the slave back to the owner and asks, or commands, depending on how, which part of it you want to put the emphasis on, to do to accept him as a slave anymore? No, no. 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 But as a brother. brother. Like me. Yeah. Yes. Brother. In fact, not just a brother, at the same level as Paul himself. Yes. yes. What's the relationship with Paul, between Paul and Philemon? Not great. Between Paul and Philemon? Yeah. 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 Very close. Very close friends. He calls him friend, he calls him partner. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there, it's, it's a, there's, Paul probably is the reason Philemon is a Christian. Yes, that's what he's saying. But, what is ruining their relationship? Onesimus. Onesimus, he ran away. So Paul, on the authority of his, on his apostolic authority, writes to, Onis, to Philemon and says, we're making things right with you, by the way. Of course, you owe me. Right? You owe me this, but I'm sending him back. Do what you want, but this is what I'd rather you do. Accept him as a brother. But he has sent the slave back. So what's so let's just cut to the chase. What's the problem that this letter addresses? It addresses a slave, a slave and it addresses a broken relationship between Philemon and Onesimus and Paul. So there's a reason Paul writes the letter. He doesn't write it just because he's in the mood to write a letter and he's in prison and has nothing better to do. He writes the letter for a specific purpose. There's a problem that has to be addressed. And what I want to say to you is that the entire Bible, in fact, virtually every religious-based writing there is, always is written to address a problem. It doesn't, it's not written to just say, God created the heavens and the earth. It's written to address an issue or a problem. All of it. And this is a, this, a nice short example of a problem being addressed. And the problem here is this slave. And who owns him? And um, what, that, what difference welcoming him back makes. And Paul is a genius because he does a little game with Onesimus' name, which is what you were getting at. Um, it's, there's a word play in here on the name of Onesimus. Onesimus means useless. Use, no. Useful. Onesimus means useful. But because he ran away, he was disobedient, he was with Paul, Philemon didn't know he was alive, all of those reasons, he was useless to Philemon. Useful to Paul, useless to Philemon. And so by playing a little game with his name, Paul says, by the way, when I send him back to you, it's not just an it's not just you know an equal, he's not the same person as he was before. Now he's useful. He won't betray you, he won't leave you, he'll be your friend, and he'll be all of that because of his relationship not with Paul but with Christ. Mm -hmm. So Paul addresses a problem and proposes a solution. What happens at the end of this? What what happens to Onesimus and Philemon? Yeah. We don't no, know. No. No. We have no idea what happens. He says prepare a room for me. Yes. I'm then, coming back. Yes, and then yeah. I'll 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 sure I'll right. so, so you know here's the guy he's locked up. He's locked up. And he's planning his his freedom, planning to go back. 
to wherever Philemon lives. We don't know where that is. Probably Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey. Um, and, um, and Paul is probably in prison. Uh, we know he was in several prisons. Um, he says he's old. Yes, so, so, so the guess is Rome, right? At the end of his lifetime, he's an old man. But the trouble with Paul is, and that's why I'm going to argue with you a little bit, is that Paul has a habit of saying, denigrating things. He either says one or two things about himself. Either he is perfect, you know, Hebrew of Hebrews, or else there's something wrong. Thorn in the flesh, um, or um, I'm an old man. So we don't know how old Paul is. So one. Ch ch it, 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 I need it, it, to go it. back on my cheat sheet and look and see when this was written. In right, it's like there's the a cheat sheet. Ones. I have a cheat sheet too. <laughs> but, the, but the trouble is, you can't answer it precisely. Yeah. You could argue on the basis of that one thing that is written from Rome at the end of Paul's life, yeah. or you could answer, uh, argue that it's written in his longest imprisonment, which was when he was in jail in Philippi and wrote a lot of letters from Philippi, which is in Greece, mm -hmm. to Asia Minor. <laughs> and that's very early. So it could be either one. Yeah. Just, but just yeah. He just, he just you know what? <laughs> help me out. Just help me out. I can't. I just can't function. He, you know, Paul is Paul is using psychology on this guy, and he's and he and he plays a game between being uh, their Herr Pastor and I'm your brother. Do what I say. <laughs> I mean, it's cool. It's 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 cool writing. It's, you have a very human writer um, asking to deal with some very human and quote divine issues at the same time, um, but it has a purpose. Is my whole point in having us read this? It's not just there to be okay. This is another story about Paul. Okay, let's go up to yeah. Titus. No, it's actually a story with a purpose. It's a letter with a purpose. And when you ask when you ask the question of a book, um, any book. Bible is more important at this point, that's what we're talking about. Why did the writer write this? What's the problem being addressed? Then you can ask yourself another question. How does this problem relate to my problem, my issues in my life? Because that's where one of the connections that's made is that, um, is, is, to, is, is that. It's not just that the Bible sits there like some kind of magic talus um, and that, you know, I can read it and I get some insight. I mean, some people just do that. But that there are issues being addressed that may relate to your issues. So in this case, there's a fracture of several relationships here that may relate to something you're living with. A fracture of several relationships over one person. It sounds like about two hours of my afternoon today, but I didn't put that together till this moment, so lest you think I planned that. So, so I want to show you just one more example, and then we're going to move from letters, of how Paul does this. And if you would turn to 1 Corinthians, which is before, uh, 1st and 2nd Corinthians is, to, let's see, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. So 1st Corinthians, um, uh, chapter 1, if you look at verse 11, Paul's writing to the church in Corinth, um, and he says in verse 11, For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is, well, we'll stop there. So, Paul has heard something about the people in Corinth. So, whatever he's heard, he's now going to respond to. Now, let me show you the responses. Um, turn to um, chapter 5. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not found even among pagans. For a man is living with his father's wife. So somehow, Paul is now going to address that problem. 
Or look at chapter 7, the first verse. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote. Aha! Now he's going to talk about sex. Then he's going to talk about, look at chapter 8. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols. Then look at um, chapter, um, yeah, I don't have to say anymore. The, 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 you see that this is a letter being written, responding to a list of questions. Here's the question. Write a response. And so Paul, again, is writing a letter to respond to a problem. And if you read 2 Corinthians, you'll find out that he got a letter back. And now he has to respond to that letter. So first, you have two letters to the Corinthians because it's an ongoing correspondence of which we only have one side. <coughs> we have Paul's side. Don't we actually think that there was a first letter that came before first Corinthians? Even before that. But we have only what we got. So the point again is that letters in the Bible, and I would say all the things in the Bible, and I would say the same thing about creeds, confessions, hymns, and prayers. What else is left? Poetry usually is addressing a problem. And so when you sing a hymn, or for instance, um, what's the problem being addressed? What's the issue here? <coughs> um, just try it out on Sunday. When you're singing, no, I'm serious. When you're singing hymns on Sunday, Ask yourself, what the Sam Hill's going on here? Not just, why did they, it's great music, or I hate this tune, or I like the old words better. Uh, all of which is true, uh, or not. But ask yourself, what's the hymn? Why are people singing this hymn? Why are people confessing, you know, why did they write this creed? What's this prayer about? There's an issue being addressed, sometimes several issues. And if you start to ask that, then I, you know, the hymn may mean something. You require singing, is this something you're singing, Beautiful Savior? I think so. Um, that's a magnificent, wonderful hymn. There won't be a dry eye in the house. Um, the choir will sing it magnificently. But there's a reason that the uh, writer wrote that hymn. Um, just think about what that might be. You might be wrong, but it's, it, it'll help you to see, get a little more out of the hymnody. Um, or anything else we do. So, one thing we learn from letters is that um, uh, often when a letter is written, um, and then again, I'm, a, I'm extrapolating here, it has purpose. It's not just there out of, it's not an internal thing. It's about a specific issue. And part of our job to read the Bible is to say, how does this issue relate to my issues? 